For those who work in the conviction integrity business, it is essential to be informed about what is happening throughout this country. Who better to give us the lay of the land, the national landscape, than John Hallway, the executive director of the Quattrone Center for the Fair Administration of Justice at the University of Pennsylvania School of Law. John, welcome to the best coast, I mean West Coast. <laughs> Thank you, Judge. Um, as for the best coast thing, I have to say I did live in the Bay Area for eight years and loved it, and it was a very sad day when we were, uh, made the decision to move back to Philadelphia. On the other hand, um, thanks to the generous donation of the Quattrone family and Denise Federaro Quattrone, who I'm thrilled to see is here with us today, uh, we were able to start the Quattrone Center at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, and while we may be on whatever the not best coast is, uh, I'm hoping that we can, uh, we can support the work of the Northern California Innocence Project, other Innocence Projects, and the fabulous DAs and conviction review units uh, that I'm going to talk about. Um, uh, so, you know, conviction review units, a national perspective is the title um, of my talk, and it'll be interesting to see if I can pull that off, because um, you know, a, a single national perspective is not something that I really think exists. But I am going to talk uh, during the time that I have about um, the emergence of conviction review units, um, some of the themes that I think uh, in our research have turned up as important in the construction and management of those review units. Uh, and this is research that we've conducted that will be part of an upcoming paper, uh, the goal of which is to help those units that are here uh, think more fully about their practices using the learnings of other units as their guides, and then hopefully also create uh, sort of a template for other uh, DA's offices or states that are thinking about constructing their own conviction integrity units to make sure that they've considered all of the issues. Because candidly, if you are a prosecutor uh, and your customers include the community, the judges, the public defenders, the victims, the victims' families, and yes, the defendants, you have a lot of conflicting interests going on there that you have to manage. Being a prosecutor is a very difficult job with a lot of competing concerns. And when you then go in and are asking those units to review secured convictions, convictions that they already believe that they have won appropriately and fairly, it's a pretty impressive thing, I think, that DAs are standing up and being willing to do that. And so the fact that we have 40 public defenders here uh, is, is wonderful. The fact that we have 37 DAs here is outstanding. And I think it's really evidence of the criminal justice system coming to grips with the fact that errors happen and being upfront and in good faith about confronting those errors. I have been told that at the end of the day, the prosecutors and the DAs are gonna have a soccer game out here in the field. So that'll be fun to watch as well. Okay, um, Lucy already gave you this stat, right? 1,668 uh, exonerations. Um, I gave a lecture to the Masters of Criminology students at Penn two days ago, and the number was 1,666. Um, we are finding exonerations now at a rate of about one every three days. Um, whether that's because there are more mistakes or because we're getting better at finding them, we don't know. Either is probably a good thing. Uh, but it's another factor when you realize that 85% of the exonerations in the National Registry are from cases that went to trial. So about 1,450 of those cases are cases that went to trial. Cases that go to trial are about 3% of all of the criminal cases in our system. So if you were to assume that that fat fraction is then true, you'd be looking at about 47,000 exonerations in the United States if we were also able to include plea bargains. That's not really a fair data comparison, but I just want to give you a sense that this 1668, I think everybody believes, is uh, vastly undercounting the number of innocent people who one way or another find themselves in prison for crimes that they didn't commit. The Innocence Project has done a wonderful job over the course of the past quarter century in redressing errors. The Quattrone Center was founded to build on that work and ask the question about how can we prevent errors, because as Benjamin Franklin says, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. This satisfies my obligation as an employee of the University of Pennsylvania to mention Benjamin Franklin in every public speech. So what the Quattrone Center did was we said, OK, how do we prevent errors? Well, let's not reinvent the wheel. If we think about criminal justice as a complex system 
of highly dynamic events with lots of human interactions where professionally trained people are making rapid decisions with incomplete information under high stress circumstances with zero tolerance for error. Are there any other environments that look like that and how have they tried to solve errors? And so we were drawn to the aviation industry, the nuclear power industry, the healthcare industry as industries that have tried to look at their procedures and processes, identify where errors are happening because of good faith professionals who are placed in environments where they make decisions that seem like the right thing that, to do at the time, but that lead to unintended outcomes. Now, I know what you're all thinking. You're thinking, yeah, but that's not the way it is in criminal justice, because in aviation, everybody wants the plane to go up and come down safely. And in healthcare, everybody wants to help the patient, but that's not how it is in criminal justice. And what the Quattrone Center is, would submit, what I would submit to you, is that in fact, you have many more people trying to do the right thing all the time, every day. And the adversarial nature of criminal justice makes us prone to see misconduct more often than it truly exists. And things like the materiality standard in Brady, which says to a prosecutor not, you have to turn over all exculpatory information, but you have to turn over exculpatory information that is material to the defense, leaves a place for a well-intended prosecutor to think, well, I don't think this is material, where a defense attorney thinks, are you kidding? This is absolutely material. And so what, one of the things that we need to do in our assessment of how the system is operating is look at the system as a series of good faith professionals. And when we do that, we will find, I think, that what we see as misconduct is often error. And when we treat error, we will not only do more good for the system, we will expose misconduct more clearly so that it's easier to deal with. Now, one thing that these effective systems of safety improvement do is they assess and review error. Criminal justice does not do this well. Criminal justice is not very good at going back and saying, what did we do wrong? In fact, before DNA, we had a big fight about whether there were errors. And it's only now that we're getting the groundswell of an acceptance of the fact that errors happen. And what we haven't then done is build feedback loops into that system that allow us to implement upstream procedures to prevent the next error. And this is where conviction review units come in, because conviction review units are really the institutional response to the Innocence Project's display of errors across the United States. And so a conviction and review unit, for our purposes, is defined as an organization that conducts extrajudicial, fact-based review of secured convictions to investigate plausible allegations of actual innocence. When Karen said that what they did in the Rick Walker case was to stop and take a brand new look at it under the totality of the circumstances, that's exactly what a convictions review unit is supposed to do. And the work that she set in motion at Santa Clara spread to Dallas, spread to Manhattan, has spread now across the country. And there are different structures. Not every one of the review units we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna talk about, have uh, are sitting within a DA's office, and so that's why we say an organization, because conviction review is actually something that could be done independent of a DA's office, and in some instances is being done, but it's this extrajudicial fact-based review for plausible allegations of actual innocence that's the universal in the structure. Now, uh, there are, we, we looked at 24 conviction review units. Two of those we're calling uh, special purpose or limited purpose conviction review units because they were funded by government grants. One uh, in Michigan to deal with DNA cases and, uh, sorry, Michigan was a firearms set of cases and Colorado had a, a limited project to look at DNA cases. So there are about 22 of these units that have sprung up uh, in uh, the last, uh, let's say, nine years since about 2006 when Santa Clara started its process and uh, North Carolina created its Innocence Commission. I don't know how well you can see this, uh, this map, but a couple of things. Um, we interviewed 17 uh, of the 22, so the, the things that I'll be talking about come from a majority, but not all of the units. The other thing is that 14 of those units, more than half, uh, were initiated after January 1st, 2014, so in the last 20 months. And so what we're seeing is a considerable uh, expansion of these conviction review units. Um, we uh, surveyed them, uh, interviewed either the DA in charge or the conviction review unit lead or both of those people with a semi-structured interview that usually took between an hour and an hour and a half. Um, merge that with public protocols and media coverage, and so uh, that's the, the data that will be the foundation of the paper um, that we're in the process of writing. Now, as you can imagine, all of these uh, DA 
units are essentially independently created. And so the very fact that your office has a conviction review unit, in my mind, is evidence that you're a progressive thinker, that the DA in your office is a progressive thinker, that they're embracing new concepts, that they're, that they're taking this seriously. Um, but because none of these offices you know, report to each other, and because each of these DAs are independent thinkers and progressive thinkers, these, these offices have emerged on an ad hoc basis, and they all have different policies and procedures. And so again, to say there's a national perspective, I think oversells it. I think there's 22 national perspectives, uh, and there are certain unifying themes and certain differences, and so the task is to, is to explain what some of those are, talk about the pros and cons, and help the DA's offices who are already embracing this concept, which is something that should be praised, make sure that they're thinking things all the way through. And it was a was a theme as we were doing these surveys that I would ask a question or two and I'd get invariably someplace where they say, oh, you know, that's a really interesting question. We haven't been confronted with that yet in the cases that we've reviewed. I'll need to give that some thought. And so it's that that leads to individual policies and procedures and what we'd like to change. So the variability in these units is high. And let's be candid. There are a lot of people who think it's all a load of crap that it's a publicity stunt, right? There are a lot of people on the defense bar who look at these conviction integrity units and they think these are convictions preservation units. Right? This is the DA trying to pull a fast one and take advantage of the publicity of this, but they're not actually going to change uh, a conviction. They're not actually going to overturn it on balance. And in our research, I would say that there's a spectrum of units that, that, uh, that exist where some are very, very open and transparent and have done a lot of exonerations. Um, Others uh, are newer, are, less, are more hesitant to, to open themselves up to potential media criticism for errors in their cases. Um, take a harder line on what cases they will look at, and the defense bar in those jurisdictions is predictably somewhat more skeptical. Um, but what I think we see, and I'll talk about this, is that the key hallmarks of, an, of a conviction review unit that is doing this in good faith are independence to make decisions, uh, flexibility to, to deal with cases that have unique circumstances and facts, and transparency to lay things out there both for uh, the petitioner, the, the person who is hopefully going to be an exoneree, um, and for the general public. Uh, and, and one thing that I will say is we've seen a number of offices that are good faith conviction review units that don't have a lot of exonerations. If your jurisdiction has a lot of exonerations, I think that can show you that the office is serious about it. But the fact that there aren't many exonerations doesn't mean that the office is not serious about it. There are other indicators of quality that I think you have to look more deeply at. In the first place, a unit that started in the beginning of December 15, or December, or in the beginning of January 2015, isn't going to have a lot of exonerations yet. These things take time. In the second place, the fact that they have a lot of petitions doesn't mean that all of those cases are actually exonerees. Some of them are, some of them are not. And so it's important to look at the, the various balancing of factors in what's going on. So, Independence, flexibility, and transparency find themselves in balancing a lot of different concerns. And offices that have set up convictions review units look to balance, in the first place, cases of actual innocence versus cases of due process. So it's one thing if somebody says, um, I'm innocent. I did not do this. It's another thing if they say, I had a really bad lawyer. I'm not going to tell you whether I think I'm innocent or not, but my lawyer should have done a better job. Now, each of those cases is certainly worthy of review, but should it be reviewed in the extrajudicial sense of the conviction review unit, or should it be left to the regular appeals process that's already set up? This is a very real topic if you're a DA and you have limited resources to put out a conviction review unit, and so that's one of the balancing factors. Another factor is, to what extent do I have written policies and procedures that outline the work that I do? Now, the Quattron Center is going to sit here and say transparency is a virtue and you should have written policies and procedures. There are some very good DA's offices and very good conviction review units that say, yeah, I get that and I'd like to have written policies and procedures, but the fact is once I put it on right in writing, I've got civil attorneys or, or, or defense attorneys who are going to hold me to that and it actually reduces my flexibility to be able to look at cases holistically, plus maybe I've just created an avenue for somebody to sue me if I deviate from my protocols. Now, we can go back and forth on the merit of those claims, but it's, again, a real claim, a good faith claim advanced by a DA's office as to why they might not want to have everything in writing. And that's a balancing factor that has to be examined when you're setting up uh, a convictions review unit. Um, I've talked about the good faith balancing versus publicity stunt. That's really an external perception issue, and I'm not going to spend a lot more time on that. 
One of the things that people point to, however, as evidence of good faith is the level to which external participants take part in these conviction reviews, either in the screening or the actual investigations, um, the assessment of the data and the recommendations that are made, or the establishment of policies. And you have uh, a spectrum there everywhere from um, the conviction review unit in my city, Philadelphia, which has no external participation, to uh, what we'll hear from Brooklyn, which actually brought a public defender and professor at Harvard to co-lead the unit to ensure that the defense perspective was represented all the way through. Again, is one better than the other? I think you can have a good faith review process without having external participants. But if you look at the case of Rick Walker and some of these other cases, you do realize that it is possible to have a confirmation bias within the prosecutorial office. And when you look at issues about materiality and Brady, you realize that the adversarial process does cause us to look at the same data differently. And so having an external perspective at different parts of the process may be useful to kick the rudder on the prosecutorial perspective of a case in ways that does what I think all of these units really want to do, which is kind of cut through all the nonsense and get to what happened, right? And so that's the question when you're creating your office is what structure is going to help you do that? If we're going to be an extrajudicial review, let's be an extrajudicial review. The reason this is necessary is that due process doesn't let us look at the facts. Due process makes us look at the legal procedural things, and we all find that a little bit unsettling. We all find that unsatisfying that you can be innocent and not have a way out of the due process system. And so if you're gonna be extrajudicial, find ways to kick that rudder, whether it's external participants or not. So let's talk about independence, flexibility, and transparency. I think the, the elements that we see in conviction review units for structural independence boil down to independence in the unit's leadership, the supervision of the unit, and the participation of external stakeholders, as I've discussed. So uh, most units that are created, but not all, will have the, um, the head of the conviction review unit reporting directly to the DA. And the DA is the ultimate decision maker in all of these. So no matter what the unit thinks, there's always a procedure to, to bring this to the DA, and the DA has the final say. What that means is when the DA comes in and says to his or her office that we are creating a new convictions review unit, there is inevitably some change that goes on in the office and some people are very accepting, some people are very resisting. What you're really talking about is implementing a unit that is delivering a new culture, a culture where we say, we're gonna review these convictions. Yes, they're ours. And if we think they're not accurate, we're gonna review them and we're gonna do the right thing and we're not gonna worry about people's histories or egos because we think that good people sometimes make mistakes. That requires the DA to follow through on that. And in one of the really interesting interviews we had, um, the, the DA who leads the conviction review unit says, my job got a lot easier when my DA got reelected for the first time. For the first you know, few years of his term, all the career guys were sort of looking around waiting to see if this was really gonna happen. Then he got reelected, we knew we were stuck with him and everybody jumped in and we all did it and now the unit's going great. <laughs> Those sort of cultural issues are very real and they need to be recognized uh, and, and, and we need to do what we can do to support DAs and heads of convictions review units by being attentive to those issues. But if you have a unit that reports directly to the DA, that sends a message to the people in your office and in the defense bar and to the public that the DA is taking that seriously. If the DA is personally involved in case reviews or closely involved, that sends a message. And if the DA is involving external stakeholders and being open and transparent and saying, these are tough issues, we're not gonna agree all the time, but there's nothing to hide here if what we're really about is getting to the truth, right? All of those things send signals. And again, can you have a good unit that does good reviews, that is structured differently? Absolutely, but these are things that we see across the offices that they're wrestling with to try and convey those messages, not just externally, but to the internal prosecutors that they work with as well. Now we'll talk about procedural flexibility. There's a, um, there's a chart from the North Carolina Innocence Inquiry Commission in your folder that has their uh, funnel. It's actually a better graphic than this one. Um, but it conveys the same basic point, which is you get these cases coming in from everywhere. And I think to Karen's point, um, there are a number of prosecutors who, who want to see certain sources of, of referrals rather than others. Um, across the board, it's probably worth noting, most prosecutors' offices that we spoke to really appreciated 
cases that come in from the Innocence Projects in their jurisdictions because they feel that those cases have been professionally assessed by people who understand the challenges, and they're not just coming in from, uh, from places where people sort of haven't looked at them and the, and the, the underlying legal concerns. Um, but the petitions come in from a lot of different places, and they need to get screened. So the first, the first layer is, what cases will I take or not take in my office? And again, since this is a voluntary process, it's kind of hard to be critical about an office that says, I will look at these in an extrajudicial process, and I won't look at those. But the broader, the more broadly it's done, the more opportunity there is to address error. The question from there really boils down to the same question asked over and over again through the process, which is, do I believe this guy is innocent enough to go to the next step? And so you start with screening, and sometimes with screening there are hard and fast rules that exclude cases. The Colorado Justice Review Project, for example, said that they would only look at DNA cases um, where uh, actual innocence could be found from the DNA test. They then excluded cases where somebody had pled guilty. Now, this is a curious thing because it's exactly the people who pled guilty that are the most likely to have DNA be the only evidence anybody would believe. Um, but that was their decision, and it was a hard and fast rule. So whatever the hard and fast rules are, you get through the screen, people devote more resources, they do a more thorough investigation. They do what Karen described in Rick's case. Let's look at all of the evidence, a totality of the circumstances. Based on that, they would then make recommendations on the case and ultimately a decision. And even here, we have a couple of different options. One is to say, we believe this person is innocent, we're gonna vacate and dismiss. Another is to say, and not all offices do this, another is to say, we don't know, but we don't trust the conviction that we got back then based on the information that was provided at the court, and so we're gonna vacate, but we wanna take another look at it actually in court because we think there is credible evidence of guilt as well. And those are very, very challenging decisions to make and to articulate, and they understandably lead to a lot of frustration if you're the exoneree or the defense counsel to get that far and get that message. But again, that doesn't mean that it's a bad faith commentary from the DA as much as it is a question if you're the DA or the head of the conviction review unit on how as a policy matter and a case by case matter are you gonna handle those cases. What's universal across the United States is that actual innocence is the coin of the realm. That's what we're trying to solve. Innocent people who are in prison. We're not looking to solve cases where uh, you weren't the shooter, you were the getaway driver. Or you know, you, 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 the, the elements of your crime should have been a lesser included offense, but you took part in it. That we're gonna continue to leave to the system as a whole. But if based on the totality of the circumstances, we think you are actually innocent, then we're gonna look at your case. Um, now, most of the offices we talk to are what I would call broad on newly discovered evidence, which means we don't define newly discovered narrowly to mean things that we just found out about. We would include as newly discovered or worthy of review information that might have been in a file somewhere, even in the defense attorney's file, but that he didn't know about. And so if you, if you look at the Venn diagram there, you've got your actual innocence cases and your kind of legal procedural due process cases. And in the middle there is an overlap where people say, I'm innocent and my counsel was ineffective which is why my innocence wasn't known at the time. And so one of the areas where some offices will deviate is on whether they'll accept those middle cases, that, that, that overlap of cases. Um, offices that, that are more flexible are gonna be willing to take a case where the basis, the legal basis of the claim is prosecutorial misconduct, is police misconduct, is junk science. The case here of George Soliotis, uh, his, his claim was actual innocence. He didn't have a factual, different factual claim. He had newly discovered evidence in the form of the advancement of fire science that now a new expert would look and, and say this wasn't arson, right? And so uh, 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 one, uh, one way to look at that would be to say, well, the original reports that these experts based their opinions on were available at the time of trial, so we're not gonna call that newly discovered evidence. A more flexible uh, definition of that would be to say, if it wasn't actually used at your trial, but it could have been, we need to look at that. There are policies that a conviction review unit can embrace that will encourage or reduce, increase or reduce the number of, accept of petitions that come uh, over the transom. Um, one is to say, while your case is being reviewed by our office, we're gonna put a stop on the time clock of your case in the appellate review. 
So once we've decided that your, that your claim has merit, we'll go to the judge and we will put in a, a motion to stop the clock so that whatever is going on with your habeas petition or whatever else, you're not suffering from that. You're not losing time in your appeals. And we're not going to have the appeals process create fake deadlines for us to solve these problems. Um, an open question for many offices is the extent to which to engage petitioner's counsel. Um, there is a school of thought that says, look, if we're really taking a brand new look at it, if we were doing this before trial right at the get-go, we would talk to petitioner's counsel, but we would conduct entirely our own investigation. There's another school of thought that says, the petitioner's counsel is a great resource to get me access to witnesses and family members who otherwise wouldn't talk to me that's going to help me understand how these things, these facts actually went down. And a witness who might not trust me as the DA might trust me if the family member or the petitioner themselves goes and says, trust the DA, they're doing this to try and really understand what happened. One risk that prosecutors worry about is they start providing information to the defense counsel and the defense counsel goes to the media and starts trying their case in the media. And so what some offices have begun doing is to engage in collaboration agreements with defense counsel where they say, look, here's the deal. We're going to go through this process. But we want you and we both to agree that we're not going to go to the media. We want you and we both to agree that we're going to share information. And sometimes attorney-client privilege becomes part of this as well, where the original defense attorney is asked to waive uh, their attorney-client privilege so that they can communicate to the prosecutors about what actually happened. And the DA perspective on this, which I think one can understand, is um, if we're going to do an extrajudicial review based on the facts, we don't want any procedures getting in the way. Now, the defense counsel response to that, which I think is reasonable to understand, is you got to be kidding me. My guy's not even supposed to be there in the first place, and you want him to give up his right to attorney-client privilege as a way to get in the game? And so these are, again, reasonable perspectives that kind of clash here, and figuring out how to resolve them has been a jurisdiction by jurisdiction thing. And it's not clear yet, because most of these units are less than two years old, what the real impact of each of these policies is going to be on the utility that a conviction review unit has in a jurisdiction. Now, I mentioned this earlier, but I want to go back and talk to it. I, we've used the term conviction review units. When these units were started, they were often called conviction integrity units. And I've had a lot of people say to me, on, particularly on the DA side, you know, it just doesn't sit right with me, right? All of our convictions, we want to have integrity. And, and to, to suggest that we're, we don't want by creating the unit and calling a conviction integrity unit to suggest that all of our convictions have flaws. We really don't believe that's the case. We think these are few and far between and we take them really seriously, but we don't want to taint the rest of them. So we've started calling them conviction review units, but there is a time when the people that we've spoken to say, we look at the integrity of a conviction. And that time is when you get to the end of your review, you know everything that you can know, and you've got a case that's a little bit like the Adnan Syed case from Serial, right? Where the conclusion of that, how many, just, just to know, how many of you guys listen to Serial? Okay, good, so basically everybody. Um, so the end of that case, you know, the, the reporter herself is like, yeah. You know, I, I don't, I, I can't say that I believe he's guilty, but then I look at everything else and I think, ah, what if I'm wrong, right? And I think it's reasonable to, to recognize that that's going to happen in these cases. And that's when we hear prosecutors saying, if we think that the conviction cannot stand as we did it at the time, it lacks integrity and we'll overturn it. Does that mean we won't retry? No. But we will take into consideration the amount of time the guy's been in prison or the woman's been in prison and the circumstances in determining what we do from there. And so a conviction review unit will look at the integrity of a conviction, but it's important to understand that, that sometimes people just won't agree and you'll be back in the adversarial process, and that doesn't mean that the review process has been a sham. Okay, so we've talked about transparency a little bit, uh, and I'm just gonna highlight there are things that, that a, a unit I think can and should do. Um, I think engaging with prosecutors' counsel to the extent possible will help get, get facts, but I think the unit as a whole is something that should be promoting itself for the DA's office. This is a good thing that we're doing this. It's the system working for itself. And so 
publishing the decisions, publishing the rationales, explaining what your policies and procedures are, and publishing your activity and metrics, those are something that we expect of all parts of government service. We expect of, uh, of, of really everybody that we work with that they share what they're doing so that we can look at it. Now, the responsibility of the community is to recognize that this is a unit that's doing something extrajudicial and voluntary, and to look at those metrics and think, how can we help, not what did you screw up? And the danger of publishing those metrics if you're a prosecutor is that they show up under the word misconduct in 97 point font on the front page of your newspaper. And we have an obligation as our communities and our media to prevent that from happening when these units operating in good faith publish their information. Okay, um, I'm running out of time so I'm just gonna summarize. We do event reviews at the Quattrone Center where we partner with prosecutors and in multi-stakeholder cases with prosecutors, defense attorney, police, and courts to look at cases where things went wrong. And the key to this comes from healthcare, which is what we call just culture event reviews. The key to doing these reviews, whether you're a convictions review unit or an academic center or what have you, is to recognize that the disciplinary pr process that happens needs to be separate from the conviction review, okay? It's not coincidence that the first question that came to Karen and Rick was, who gets blamed? In the criminal justice system, that's what we do for a living. We allocate blame. Nothing could be harder to make our system safer than worrying about who we punish, okay? I know that everybody finds evidence of official misconduct in all these cases. I know we can find it anywhere we believe it's there. It's the same kind of confirmation bias that we accuse the prosecutors of having when they look at an individual. I'm not saying it's not there. I'm just saying let's separate it from conviction review units. And all of the units that we've talked to, if they see prosecutorial misconduct in their cases, they have a procedure to isolate it, send it over to a disciplinary process, whether it's within their office or involving the state bar, and that's exactly what they should be doing. That should happen in a separate process because nobody's gonna participate in the conviction review process if they think that they're gonna get punished or sued as a result, okay? So blaming the individual does not make the system safer, and we're not, going to fire or punish our way out of 50 years of Brady violations. So let's let the unit do its work, and when we have prosecutorial misconduct, let's look at that process, let's look at the state bar process for how we're gonna handle that. Okay, last thing. The promise of conviction review units is not just to review, but to learn from the cases we have reviewed and to implement upstream processes that will help us prevent error. This procedure has largely gone unmet, and very few conviction review units, even the ones that I would describe as the most good faith, are able to do that. Part of this is structural. A convictions review unit within a DA's office, how are they gonna solve a sheriff not turning over information, or an interrogation by the police that leads to a false confession? You have to have a multi-stakeholder review, you have to have the buy-in of the other people in your jurisdiction in order to do it, and you need to put a procedure in place that, that when you change a policy, that you track and optimize so that whatever procedure you've put in place to change something doesn't create another problem in the complex system that we have. So just to summarize, it may very well be that conviction review units are DAs being the change we want to see in the world. They have the promise to do that. It's a hugely important thing, and the DAs that have decided to participate in it should be praised uh, loudly and often. That said, with all of the different policies, the ad hoc creations, and some of the structural limitations about the ability to learn from error, the impact of the conviction review units can be limited, and it'll be important that all of the units that are participating in that think of these things as they're doing their work to maximize the positive impact they can have on the jurisdiction. The jury's still out, no pun intended, but hopefully our paper and events like this uh, will help to uh, give people more to think about and allow us to kind of break through the adversarial barriers that we have to do what actually conviction unit review units are designed to do, which is, are you innocent? If so, we want to fix that. Thanks very much. Okay, I'm, I'm told to tell you I'm taking Q&A. Uh, the question is, are conviction review units more effective when based in prosecutors' offices? And effective here is defined as securing exonerations. Um, so you will hear from the North Carolina Innocence Inquiry Commission, um, which is a unique organization because it was created by the legislature and it um, 
It operates as a state agency uh, to gather all of the petitions in the state of North Carolina, do an independent examination, and then go to a hearing if they believe there is a need at which the relevant DA would participate. Um, the, there are a couple different ways to answer your question. The first answer is we don't know because one of the advantages of North Carolina is it's extraordinarily independent, and because it's created by the legislature, it's extraordinarily transparent. And so we know how effective they have been um, uh, in reviewing cases, and they have exonerated eight? Eight individuals. Um, now, we don't know those metrics for a lot of other conviction review units, and as I said earlier, I don't think the number of exonerations should be the sole measure of quality. Um, but what I would say is I think there is a um, an advantage to the independents uh, and an advantage to being outside the DA's office in that you're doing your own investigation. One of the things that we learned about North Carolina in particular is that they've gotten particularly good at finding information that uh, other agencies said they couldn't find. So they've developed, there's, a, there's actually a particular expertise in finding old files. And they've developed that and many of the DA's offices that we've spoken to have not. Um, but. Um, but there's a flaw or a potential risk also, which is that you really are independent and nobody in a DA's office is going to necessarily help. And that's going to vary office to office. So I think that's the risk. Can you comment on the relationship between conviction review units and best practices committees as mechanisms for identifying systemic sources of error in the decision making process in a DA's office? So um, hopefully the two are working together. Uh, a best practices committee may or may not be doing individual case reviews. And best practices is always put in quotes because nobody really knows what it means, me included. Um, but the idea is, I think, if you have a conviction review unit that's doing case reviews, they should be uh, bringing errors that happen that they know about to a best practices committee who should be sitting and thinking about the environmental issues, the structural challenges, the supervisory issues, and really doing what in aviation or healthcare we would call a root cause analysis to understand why a good faith prosecutor, police investigator, what have you, made decisions that led to the unintended result of a wrongful conviction and then works to change the system to, to plug those gaps. And so I think hopefully you're, you're getting both of those things working in tandem. 30 seconds, we're under the speed round now. Should there be an independent body overseeing these? Um, well, that's North Carolina, right? That's the, that's the structure, is, a nor, is, a, is an independent body overseeing these. And I think what North Carolina has done is great. Um, I think uh, it's, it's the same challenges uh, in a different clothing, essentially. Um, and I think that, in theory, there is another independent body overseeing these, which is courts. Um, but I'm not sure who that independent body would be because one of the challenges that we have in all of criminal justice is that each county is its own silo. And unless you have a statewide body that you've agreed to do this, um, you know, then you have 50 of those. Uh, there is one federal uh, conviction review unit in the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C. Uh, but uh, other than that, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough to envision how that would work, but it sounds like a cool idea. Thanks very much, Jeff. John Hallway. So John Hallway and the Quattrone family, more heroes. Thank you both. Uh, thank the family. Thank John. We're going to take a break and convene right promptly at 10.30, 10 minutes.